Hello, everyone, and welcome to our activist author interviews for Activist Appreciation Month. This is our special time of year where we celebrate all the work that activists do to help animals. And this is part of In Defense of Animals Sustainable Activism campaign. And what we do is provide emotional and spiritual tools for animal activists. And this month, we're featuring these special interviews with activist authors. And the one that person that we're going to interview today is Brittany Michelson, who's a dear friend. And she's just published her very first book. And we're so excited to support her. So what I'm going to do, my name's Lisa Levinson. If you don't know me, I'm very excited to be your host tonight and I run the sustainable activism campaign and so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our featured speaker today. So Brittany Michelson is a teacher, a writer, and an animal rights activist. She holds a MFA in creative nonfiction from Antioch University in Los Angeles and teaches writing and activism related classes in a private K through eight program. Brittany's writings appear in multiple journals and literary sites. She lives in Topanga Canyon. Great. How are you doing, Brittany? Great. Thank you so much for having me and um, two of my contributors on. Yes, we have, that's wonderful. We've got you and um, we also have Amy Jean Davis and we've got Gwenna Hunter and we will introduce you to them more a little bit later in the program. But right now, do you mind if I ask you a few questions, Brittany? Yeah, please do. Okay, great. Yay. <laughs> We're doing this interview style, which is really fun. So my first question for you today is, what gave you the inspiration to create this book? Um, well, I thought of the idea to create an anthology of animal rights activism um, for a few reasons. One is that I believe strongly in the power of, of writing, um, of language, of words. And um, in our movement, I believe that all angles are necessary to get our message across for the animals. So the arts are a really important part of, of activism, uh, films, music, visual art, and, and writing, books and articles, etc. So I thought um, there's so many powerful voices in the movement, uh, some long-standing voices and other newer voices. And I, I just thought it would be a really great um, project to put together an anthology featuring um, very established voices and newer voices and gathering different perspectives, different forms of activism, different experiences um, of animal rights activists. And so um, I started in June, 2018, uh, was when I initially started the project and um, I, yeah, that, I basically just feel like we need as many angles and, and voices out there. And um, I believe in the power of, of literature. Very powerful indeed. There have been many books that have inspired so many activists. And I know that yours will be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Why do you feel this book is important for the animal rights movement? Um, well, I sort of along the lines of what I, what I said is that um, I, I really believe that the power of stories can reach many hearts and minds. Um, when people make a connection to somebody's story, somebody's personal experience, it can really make an impact. And so in the book, there are um, a variety of perspectives, a variety of experiences and backgrounds um, and that really um, help inform the overall message that we are working towards, which is justice for all animals and for all animals to be free of exploitation. And so um, I'm lucky that I, I have a mainstream publisher and so the distribution um, is going to be really good for the book. Um, and so I'm hoping that it will really reach a wide audience and um, hopefully change a lot of hearts and minds for the animals. Oh, great. That's an amazing mission. And I'm wondering, so what message do you hope to share with the public, the general public? 
Uh, well, I, a few things. I, I hope that the public will, I mean, the, the book is geared towards like ev everybody that it can possibly reach. So the general public, the mainstream public, people that, um, you know, people that are not already vegan, that are not activists, that um, may be exposed to some of these issues of animal exploitation for the first time through reading the book. Um, I'm hoping that a lot of those types of people will pick the book up, um, either, you know, because from one of the contributors um, that who, you know, has a family member or a friend who's not vegan and they say, hey, I'm in this book and, you know, give it a read. And we can reach so many people through the contributors themselves. Um, and also just the, the wide distribution of the book. Um, and then also it, the book is intended for animal rights activists to be um, a, a resource and inspiration for us to, to share uh, stories with each other and to um, inspire and motivate us to just to keep going um, to um, strengthen our, um, our our resolve to you know just power power through even when the you know the going gets tough and we you know it's it's hard to um, deal sometimes with different aspects of um, of the movement or you know just the cruelty that we're subjected to we we know so much cruelty it's very difficult. Um, but we're such a support system to each other, and we have all these powerful stories in the book. Um, and I'm hoping that it will motivate more um, vegans who are not yet activists to uh, take action. I'm really hoping this will also jumpstart um, many vegans on the activist path as well. Mm. Yes, I have heard that from different activists um, through our support line that that is a frustration how do we get mm. people who are vegans to take that next step mm. so this this mm -hmm. would be a good book to recommend for that yeah um so i'm wondering how are the stories specifically important ways to get that animal rights message across um well so there's a mix of um highly established voices um and newer voices, and there, there are diverse perspectives, diverse backgrounds. Um, I, I really wanted the, the book to be as all-inclusive as possible. I mean, obviously there are so many voices, so many stories in the movement um, that I wish I could have had like a hundred contributors, you know I mean? But you can't have like a 500, 600 page book. So it's like I had to, um, to limit it. Um, I have 27 contributors and, um, you know, d diversity is very important to me and um, intersectionality. And so I wanted these different elements to be represented. Um, and sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> you, know, you, you, are, you are answering but, it. That is ahead. great. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that um, actually I'm curious about your uh, contributors and also yeah. uh, like the process of putting the book together. Maybe share a bit about that. Sure. Um, oh, first of all, the, the book has six sections. Um, and so like section one is seasoned, war seasoned warriors, inspiring and transforming. Um, and then there, there, there are six sections all together, um, ending with the sanctuary life. And so um, these different perspectives and experiences are divided into those six sections. Um, as far as the contributors go, um, I mean, I reached out to certain contributors that I, uh, certain activists that I know personally. Um, and then I also reached out to others through connections that I have in the movement. Um, and um, again, I just really wanted there to be a variety of, of perspectives and experiences represented. So, I mean, there's a piece in the book um, by Jill Robinson, founder of Animals Asia, about her plight to end bear bile farming. And that's like, an issue that, um, you know, here in the States, we're not, a lot of people aren't even aware of that, of that issue, but um, it's not like uh, an area that we're, you know, focusing on here in the States because it's, it's an issue of exploitation happening in um, parts of Asia. And so, you know, people will learn about that, about the bear bile industry. Um, and then, you know, I have, um, you know, a piece uh, by Amy about, you know, bearing witness um, there are pieces about, um, you know, different types of activism, um, but also like different um, processes and experiences of self-growth, like how, 
how people have grown and learned and changed through their activism, I mean, that's woven into most of the pieces in some capacity. Um, but yeah, I, I love, I love the titles of, of the pieces. They're so, um, it just really represents such a, a range um, within the movement. Yeah, I can hear that you, you, part of your, your goal was to, to share all the different types of voices that are in the animal rights movement. And I think that's amazing. You've got 27 people joining into this. This is phenomenal, it really is. Yeah, it, I mean, I, I'm really happy with, um, you know, the, the list of contributors as it turned out. Um, and like I said, I wish, I mean, there's so many more activists I can think of that I would have loved to have in the book. Um, and who knows, maybe there will be a um, volume two, who knows. But I just, yeah, I mean, I would love to include more people and um, more voices. But again, you know, I couldn't have, I couldn't have like 50 contributors. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so I, um, first thing was I wrote, you asked about the process. I wrote a book proposal. Um, that was definitely a learning curve. I had to learn how to write a book proposal and it was, it was a lot of work because they're very involved. They involve like multiple components. Um, they involve research. You have to basically like sell the idea you're pitching the book to publishers. So once that was uh, ready to go, then I sent it out to um, some publishers um, and I, um, you know, I was communicating with my contributors at different points in time over the months, you know, over, over time, it's like I had different, was a lot of communicating in different, um, with different people at different times. And then, um, you know, I provided my feedback on their, on their pieces um, to help shape the pieces. Um, some of the pieces needed more revision than others, and some needed more editing than others. Um, and then I edited them and I sent the whole thing off to the publisher on the deadline. And um, yeah, so I mean, it was a, it was a, a lot of work, um, but so inspiring and rewarding. Like I, I'm so um, inspired by my amazing contributors and, and their powerful stories and so grateful to them for, um, you know, just like committing to this and working hard on their pieces um, and being open to my feedback and open to my editing and, they were just they're receptive and um, really wonderful uh, human beings to work with, and I am very grateful to them. Can you share a few of their names so that people who are listening might um, yeah. might get a little uh, little taste beforehand? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I mean, should I share a few or? Yeah, you yeah, you can share a few. Anymore? However many you feel you'd like to share. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have I mean, a couple of them with us today, so we'll get to hear from them soon. <laughs> yeah, I um. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, there are twenty-seven. So, um, uh, so like I've got Sean Monson, um, filmmaker, uh, of course, of Earthlings and others. Um, I have Anita Kreintz, founder of the Save Movement. Um, there's like Jean Bauer founder of Farm Sanctuary. I mentioned Jill Robinson, founder of Animals Asia. Um, I have Lek. Uh, she's from Thailand and she's like a personal hero of mine. She's the founder of um, Save Elephant Foundation and runs an amazing sanctuary that I've volunteered at twice in Thailand. Um, and I have um, Sean Hill. Sean Hill, um, local LA uh, spoken word uh, performance poet. He wrote the only poem in the book. So there's a poem at the end of the book, which is an ode to activists. Mm -hmm. um, and I have um, like a good friend of mine, Zafir Molina, who's local in, in LA. Um, and Jasmine Afshar is a, an Arizona activist. Just a, yeah, a, a variety um, of, of activists. Uh, Great. I could, name, I could keep naming them but oh well I mean I think it's good to give a sample and then people yeah. can it might per pique yeah. their interest to know oh this person's in the book and here's some new voices in the book that they'd be curious to hear more about and so I know that you've really artistically selected the the people who who were the contributors and that that is a huge part of what you put together and just the vision that you've had and and all the the um, details uh, that are involved in putting and publishing, getting a publisher to, to put your book in in their, um, to promote it for you. So Thank this you. is- Yeah, one, one thing I just wanted to mention is that mm -hmm. it was really important to me to not just have like the very established voices 
um, in the book. I, I really wanted there to be a mix. So um, representing newer voices and, um, you know, the longer term, uh, highly influential voices that a lot of people have heard already. It's, I wanted there to be a balance. Um, and so that's one thing I'm, I'm happy with what I chose to do for that. Great. Now tell us about the contributors that you brought on today and how they got involved in the book. Okay. Um, so, well, I know both Amy and Gwenna uh, personally um, through activism in Los Angeles. And um, I am just inspired, uh, greatly inspired by both of them and everything they do. So Amy, um, being the founder of Los Angeles Animal Save, um, she started the Los Angeles chapter of the SAVE movement, um, which is the largest um, attendance of any of the SAVE movement chapters. Um, and it, it's just amazing what has been accomplished through this chapter. Um, and the, um, the uh, like depth and, and, and reach of, of this chapter. I mean, of, of course there have been you know, celebrity uh, appearances at, you know, many of the vigils like Joaquin Phoenix, who's a regular vigil attendee, um, and like Kat Von D has attended and, and others as well. Um, and, but just Amy with her um, organizing ability and um, sending out these uh, excellent emails with all of the information and just very clear and she's very dedicated. And I, um, I'm just so amazed with the people that that go week after week after week and i actually been meaning to get back to a vigil um it's it's been a while since i've been and i i'm feeling the calling to get back over there so i'll be attending soon but um yeah it's just there's such an amazing group of dedicated people that attend those um and then gwenna um is the founder of vegans of la and the community events coordinator um for vegan outreach and um, no, Gwenna, a personal friend here in LA. And uh, Gwenna actually spoke at, she was featured at one of the vegan spirituality potlucks. Um, and her story is so powerful, the way that she came to veganism and everything, uh, her, her path and her perspective and her experience really is very moving. And so I reached out to Gwenna after that to say, um, you know, would you like to contribute to the book um, and um, I, her, her perspective and her experience is, is very valuable and, and important for the, uh, the movement. And um, so, yeah, I just personally connected to both of them. Great. And just so for those people who don't know, I, I run the vegan spirituality group in Los Angeles. So I know Gwenna as well. I also know Amy. And um, that's really a, such a beautiful way of connecting that to show how uh, the, the animal rights movement, the people in the community are connected, that we, we attend each other's events and we, we learn from each other and we get inspired. And I think your book is such a great example of all of that. So do you mind if I ask your contributors a couple of questions? Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Okay. And this, this, um, they're a similar question. Maybe both of you could take, take an answer to, to, um, to see each different angle on it. The first question is, how is being a part of this anthology a special opportunity as an activist? Who would like to try first? And let, let me see. How about, um, why don't we have uh, Amy? Why don't you share first? Uh, well, it's a huge honor to be a part of this book. Um, I, I'm one of those people who was not an activist for the first 10 years of being vegan. And I just am so embarrassed about that. And I feel like this book will catch people in their, wherever moment they are in being vegan, but not yet an activist and will inspire them to become one. Um, I wish I had stumbled upon something like this <laughs> back in year one or two. <laughs> so, um, so it's just a huge honor to be a part of the book uh, for so many reasons. Um, and the opportunity for me to share my personal experience with running LA Animal Save and also being a mom, I, I know that somebody out there will connect with my experience and it will move them 
to either, you know, consider becoming vegan or becoming vegan or becoming a vegan activist. And I know this because um, humans are so complex that we, uh, we receive the message and we make that connection in so many different ways. So somewhere out there is at least one person who's going to read my story in Brittany's book and go, okay, I'm ready. Wow. That's awesome. How about you, Gwenna? Oops. Hold on one sec. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, like Amy, I'm very honored as well uh, to be a part of this. It's, you know, I always tell people I can't imagine. It's hard to believe this is my life. Um, several years ago, you could have never told me this would be my life at all. Hmm. So um, very often things like this happen where you get to contribute to a book and be a part of a really amazing piece of this movement. And it's just mind blowing. And for me to be able to share my unique experiences that I've had um, while on this path to being vegan. And to me, the path never ends. There's still more to learn. There's still more to do. There's still, you know, level 100 veganism, you know, <laughs> um, it's just a, a really beautiful, beautiful thing. And I meet so many people that want to do more, but they're intimidated by the movement based on what they may have saw in a movie or what they may have heard their friends say. And so I tell people like, you know, I, I give people my experience of how I got involved in the movement. And so, you know, again, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to just to share what's in my heart with other people. And I hope people are inspired by it. Mm, that's beautiful. So my second question overlaps a little with the one that you just answered, but I'm curious, what message, if you could, um, a takeaway message from your piece, what would you like to convey through, through it? What is it that you want people to take away if they got like one message? And let's see, how about if we have um, Amy, why don't you answer first? Uh, I would want people to take away the message that, um, mothers don't want their babies taken from them and babies don't want to be taken from their mothers. That would be the message that I would hope uh, the parents out there would take, especially the moms, because it's so interesting. You don't really, you don't know what it's like to be a mom until you're a mom. I thought maybe I'd have a kind of an idea of just from taking care of, of non-human animals, but there's a, an element to it that is so strong and so, I don't know, indescribable that, but once you experience it, you're like, oh, other mothers experience this. And the idea of having to, uh, the idea of someone taking your baby away is, um, it's just incomprehensible. So that's the message I'm hoping that um, moms take from my piece. Mm, thank you. Thank you for sharing that in such a heartfelt way. Yeah. Mm. And Gwenna, how about you? you? Kind of repeat. I know the question, but can you just repeat it one more time? <laughs> oh, it's just if you had a take home message, like what is the one thing you hope people get from your piece? Um, that all forms of oppression really come from the same blueprint. And I know as a black woman coming into this movement, I was kind of, sometimes you try to find your way in this movement and you're like, you're scared to say certain things because you see the majority doesn't want to hear that or this doesn't want to be, want to talk about certain things. Um, but I really want people to understand that it's okay to fight for animals. Um, it's okay to love animals um, and that you don't have to choose. You don't have to say, oh, you care about animals more than you care about people. So simple. You can care about animals and people. Maybe people just need to hear that and need permission. So I'm hoping that that will open up people's hearts that you can do both. Mm. 
Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks to both of you for sharing that. So now I'd actually like to turn it over to Brittany. I think she is planned to give everyone a little taste of what the book's about by um, sharing a piece of some of the, the contributor, her own and the contributor's stories. Okay. Um, yeah, so I thought it would be neat for each of us to read a section from our piece. And so I'll start with either of you, um, I'll, I'll go last. And um, so I'll read the title of your piece and, and then um, you can just go ahead and read it. Do you want, do you want to start, Gwenna? <laughs> yeah, give your- Yeah, start. Okay, um, so Gwenna's piece is called Copy and Paste Activism Does Not Work, Perspectives from a POC. I am fortunate to gain value from both sides. What is unfortunate is that the white vegan and black vegan communities are often separated. Imagine if we came together to make change. It would be a day of reckoning for the meat and dairy industries. We would be much more effective if we took the time to learn how to gain an understanding of each other and help educate one another on how to advocate for the other in ways that go beyond veganism. After all, this lifestyle is about doing no harm, no harm to any being. This is why I often include conversations about human oppression on my Vegans of LA page. I often hear white vegans say that the vegan conversation should only be focused on animals because they are voiceless. But if we cannot interact with the oppressed humans and show them that we care about them as well, people will still continue to eat animals. We cannot save one species without saving the others. Forms of oppression are all connected and operate from the same methods of control, commodification and mental programming to keep us enslaved and oppressing one another. For me, the definition of veganism has evolved to encompass a harmonious balance on earth for everyone, where danger, fear, and toxic toxicity are replaced with compassion and love for all. Beautiful, so beautiful, powerful, thank you. And so important, so important and powerful. Yeah. Hmm. So Amy, just and then, oh yeah, so then Amy, Amy's piece is Bearing Witness to Babies Before and After Motherhood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Baby toy going off. Okay. Um, as a new mother, my world has become full of perhaps the strongest kind of love, a mother's love for her child, and it has also become more terrifying. Animal rights activists are deeply ah. aware of the egregious cruelty committed against animals, but to know firsthand how a mother feels for her baby while knowing that billions of mothers are forced to stand helplessly by while their children are taken from them is a crippling thought. The thought of someone taking my baby away for any reason, causes a knot in my stomach and immediate tears in my eyes. Then considering a baby's experience, just wanting her mother, but getting the rough hands of workers taking her to her death instead. How can this be the world I live in? How is it that I live among human beings who pay for this kind of violence? Human beings who are familiar with love, yet deny it to 70 billion sentient scared beings each year reserving it for whichever animals their culture has taught them are acceptable to love. These human beings are members of my own family whom I watch dote on their cats and do their dogs and cats and then turn around and sink their teeth into the mutilated bodies of animals who are every bit as sentient. Thank you, beautiful and powerful as well. Like both of these excerpts that you each read are amazing. <laughs> and um so important and necessary and they will change hearts and minds mm. thanks amy mm. um all right and so uh just a second <laughs> So 
So Brittany's getting prepared to read uh, a piece from, from her uh, part of the book, <laughs> which is great. Okay. Um, and so my piece is called Living in Alignment with My Values, My Path to Animal Rights Activism. And this is the excerpt. Becoming vegan was one of the best decisions I've ever made for two significant reasons. It was from that moment that I started living in true alignment with my values. As I am against animal abuse, against the destruction of the environment, and against damaging human health. Veganism also resonates with me on a spiritual level. The idea of non-harm to fellow beings. And I realized that energetically, I didn't want to consume torture. As someone who values feminism, I realized that I could not accept the exploitation of female bodies, regardless of species. Second, Becoming vegan led me to animal rights activism, which has gifted me with a focus and motivation that is greater than myself. It has inspired me to be of service to suffering beings and the planet, while bringing human connections into my life that are based on fundamental values. It is a challenge being vegan in a world that values convenience, tradition, and palate pleasure over sentient lives. But when I feel overwhelmed by the cruelty and frustrated with the societal conditioning that permits animal exploitation, I focus on the amazing community of animal rights activists that I am a part of. While society at large views, quote, food and clothing animals as products, we view them not as unknowns in the industry's machine, but as individuals worth fighting for with the privilege of our human voice. I have participated in all kinds of disruptions, demonstrations, protests, marches and vigils, and I have connected with people from diverse walks of life. Some have been vegan for many years, and some have recently turned vegan. Many of us feel that it is our obligation to stand up for animals by engaging in activism, to make up for the years that we were complicit, complicit in their suffering. People who are not involved in the movement often refer to animal rights activism as a passion, but in a world where innocent animals are horrifically exploited by humanity, taking action for them is a moral imperative. As a part of the animal rights community, I feel a sense of belonging that surpasses any sense of belonging I previously felt. Regardless of age, background, experience, or any other categorical factor, there is an instant bond with fellow activists, a bond between those who believe that animals' lives are more important than taste, habit, convenience, or tradition. It is a profound experience to come together to bear witness to truckloads of animals outside a slaughter facility and to spend hours with hundreds of activists at a factory farm for a mass open rescue. While some might wonder what the point is of giving water to pigs about to die or singing songs of liberation to chickens trapped in buildings, we know that every individual deserves to be honored and that their stories must be told. I am dedicated to bringing justice to the victims of speciesism and planting seeds in the minds of people who have been conditioned by society, as we all have, to passively accept and fund the abhorrent treatment of sentient beings by industries that view them as dollar signs. Within my activism, I have discovered the power in my voice as I speak truth to the public through a megaphone at nonviolent protests and disruptions. I feel empowered in speaking up for silenced victims by attending actions and also in the form of writing. Living in alignment with my values and being committed to work that inspires and fulfills me has also helped alleviate anxiety. My struggles pale in comparison to the nightmare that so many animals are constantly subjected to. Furthermore, while animal cruelty continues to upset me, it doesn't provoke the level of anxiety that it used to because I know that I am actively part of the solution. I live for the day when animal exploitation ceases to exist and when non-humans are valued and respected for the individuals they are. Until that day, I will continue to take action. Wow, very powerful indeed. I uh, receive calls from our animal activist support line, people who are in distress. And I think this passage that you just read, Brittany, really um, 
will inspire and help to motivate and heal people who are feeling um, discouraged by what they see in the media and what they're experiencing um, with in communities that aren't aligned with veganism. So this will definitely, I'm definitely going to recommend this <laughs> to people who call for support. And I so appreciate you um, sharing this passion that you have for you. animal rights and the movement and by bringing together all of these amazing contributors. It's is definitely going to be of value for people who um, would like to learn more about what does it mean to be an animal activist. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm wondering, I think now maybe we'll um, encourage uh, anyone else who has questions. We have an opportunity for people who have joined us, if they're in the interview with us in the platform and here. Lisa, to, real quick, can I mention yeah. where the book is available? Oh, of course, of okay. course. Um, so the publisher is Skyhorse Publishing. So of course it's available on the Skyhorse Publishing website. Um, it's also available, uh, of course, on Amazon, um, barnesandnoble.com, um, Books A Million, IndieBound, and it's, it's available on a variety of sites. Um, I'm not exactly sure which bookstores it will end up in, um, although I did um, inquire with my two favorite bookstores in LA, and it, it's already on order um, for both of those, so that was, I was excited about that. Um, and the release date is March 3rd, so it's still um, available for pre-order right now. That's great. And we're actually getting like a sneak preview here on this <laughs> activist author interview, which is wonderful. Hopefully it'll, it'll motivate people to, to go and purchase the book when it's actually out for release, which is coming right up. Hmm. So does anyone who's joined us, if you have a question, you can either, you can, uh, we have a Q&A section that's part of the Zoom platform that you can type your question in or you can type it into a chat box um, or you're welcome to um, join us. You can press the raise hands button and I'll call on you. So just wanted to see if anyone who's joined us has any questions for either for Brittany or for her contributors about the book. Yay. And we're also live too. So there may be some people who have questions in the live feed as well. We'll just give a little moment and see if anybody's there. Oh, looks like we've got a, a chat. <laughs> um, so there is a question here from Elisa. She asks, are there any essays on recovery from being a carnivore? Hmm. Um, there are uh, pieces that touch on that. So um, there are certainly uh, certain contributors who um, do describe their experience, um, you know, becoming vegan and their, their past feelings and emotions um, associated with um, their past of consuming animals. Um, there's not a piece that's specifically like, like that's just the focus, but there are certainly um, elements that, that touch on that um, in certain pieces. Um, there are uh, a couple pieces about recovery, like, um, you know, from uh, Dotsie Bausch, um, her piece is uh, about, um, you know, she's an Olympic medalist, uh, a cyclist, um, and she had a, a past um, history of drug addiction and then how she overcame that and, um, you know, ended up becoming um, an animal rights activist. So there's some recovery elements in the book. Mm, very interesting. Wow. So you've got both, both types of recovery. You've mm -hmm. got recovery yeah. from a carnivore, being carnivore, and also from, from uh, drugs and alcohol. And then... Looks like we've got, oh, uh, Lisa says, excellent. Thanks so much. Blessings to all of you on your amazing work. Thank you. Yeah. I think that you'll be getting lots of blessings from people because this is so powerful what you're doing. And also you're really letting us into the window. It's like a window into this world of animal activism, who's in there and, and what sorts of um, 
uh, stories have come along with each person. So I just wanted to, to say that I'm really, really looking forward to digging in to all of these stories and getting to know all of these 27 people in a really different way. So thank you so much. We do have another, another question I'm going to ask for you. Um, more of a comment, and this is from um, Tessa. She says, um, oh, she says that she's crying as what was said by all panelists is so true and that it resonates with her feelings so deeply and also the uh, her actions for animals for decades um, mm. and that she feels that 2020 is going to be the year of a beginning for the liberation of all abused species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's such a wonderful um, uh, comment. Thank you, Tessa, for sharing because I think this is what you're going to receive, Brittany. That people are going to be so overwhelmed with um, feeling and emotion and that sense of camaraderie that it's going to open their heart. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just checking to see if there's any other questions or comments and. Um, also, uh, taking a moment to to really thank you for for doing this, for not only writing the book, uh, but for also um, being able to join us for this activist author series and to share a bit about it, so we get a preview and to even do a reading. This is wonderful to get a little taste of what the book is going to be like, and I'm so excited to to dig into it. Is there anything else that you might want to share? I think there's a, another question. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. We do have a, a question here. This is um, from Maple. She asks, how do you keep compassion, your compassion muscle, um, in really good shape? Uh, for example, um, have compassion for dairy lovers. Like, how do you have compassion for everyone um, who you're being within your activist um, mm -hmm. efforts? Um, would one of you like to, or both of you want to share your thoughts on that? Oh, we, we can't hear you. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Sure, I can, I can share. Um, and let me tell you, um, I struggle with the compassion, even though that is like my theme is being compassionate, but it doesn't mean that I'm not human. Mm -hmm. um, I still get triggered. I still get tested. I still say things and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, but what helps is at the end of the day, I try to go back and rewind how I handle things. And you have to remember that we're all victims of this programming. And some people, the programming is more wired than others. And, you know, I always tell people just because you woke up to it at 6 p.m., on December 13th and 19, you know, 91, it doesn't mean that everyone else did. Everyone's journey is unique. Um, everyone's lifestyle is unique. Um, and, you know, the best thing you can do is plant the seed. And because it took me years um, on this particular, I know it's like super dark in here. <laughs> it took me years on this journey to finally get it. I mean, I had to have dreams, supernatural, levit like all types of crazy things. And then one day I was like, ah, now I get it. And then I was so hard on myself because I'm like, wow, it was all right there in front of me. But again, you know, everyone, you know, it's don't be mad at the person. It's, it's this system that's been designed to make us all oppress each other. And so just try to keep that in mind to, to be compassionate. It, it helps me when I feel like I'm, I'm triggered and I want to lash out, which is quite often. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to share any thoughts on that, Amy? Or, or? Yeah, I would say that um, we can get easily tripped up with the individual or a specific situation, um, a concept, uh, we can really get tripped up on that and we can get discouraged and we can get worn out. Uh, so the way to combat that for me is to remember that our thoughts matter and we need to visualize a vegan world. We need to 
we, we need to make sure that we're not getting stuck in our own thought process, that we're not becoming, as uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza says, a, a victim of our own personality. We're surround as activists, we're surrounded with the cruelty. We see it, we don't turn away. That's part of bearing witness. Um, so we have to, uh, in, you know, visualize as much as we can that the, the programming and the brainwashing and the oppression is over and a new dawn is, you know, beginning for, for mankind and non-mankind, non-human mankind, mm -hmm. um, all kind. Uh, so in, instead of getting stuck or tripped up by, by the individual or the specific situation, take your focus away from that and just, and just see what you want to see in your mind. A vegan world where people understand that if we're sentient, we should be protected and, and respected and, and vice versa. Nice. Thank you for answering those questions. We actually have another question. This one is, um, uh, Aoi asks, uh, just curious as to whether or not animal liberation includes um, disallowing domesticated animals that are unlikely to survive in the wild to reproduce. I just have to run that over in my mind for a second. Can okay. you you I will repeat it. I will repeat yeah. it. Curious as to whether or not animal liberation includes disallowing domesticated animals unlikely to survive in the wild to reproduce. I'm happy to take. Uh, yeah, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, that one. Um, so uh, for those of you who who are guardians of a companion animal, a dog, a cat, uh, any species that I've got chickens and pigs behind me. Um, I'm sure that there's probably not a lot of people that you would trust to take care of those animals if you needed to leave town or, or be away. And, and just knowing that the, the level of consciousness of most people in the world isn't as high as, as it would, you know, as it should be. I mean, it, as it, it, to, to make the world nicer, we need a higher level of consciousness. So I, I don't want people owning pets. I don't want people to, to have these animals that we've physically changed. We've changed their, the, the shape of their brains. It's part of domestication. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of humans uh, establishing their dominance over others, mm -hmm. uh, the domestication in, in my opinion. And so at some point, it would be really wonderful if we could stop messing with other species, including animals like dogs or cats, mm -hmm. and only providing homes to those that that need it, and um, and it, and making them sterile since they are something a, a human creation, which is just further upsetting the balance of of nature. So it's my opinion that animal liberation will include animals being actually liberated and not uh, created to be in some way dependent upon us for survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I would echo what Amy said. Um, and also part of achieving liberation is, um, you know, we want, we, we, we want uh, breeding, the, the breeding of domestic animals to stop. There are so many unwanted uh, dogs and cats overflowing the shelters. And um, I mean, there is no reason in this day and age why there needs to be people breeding dogs and cats, like, you know, breeders who are, you know, they breed their animals and then they sell them and then they breed them again. I mean, it just, it causes so many issues and it's just not fair to the animals. And we just, we we don't need that. Like this is this is a day and age. It's like we need to be rescuing and providing homes for the uh, animals that are the domesticated animals that are already out there. Um, and you know, adopt, don't shop. I, I tell my students that a lot. <laughs> like you know, I'm like planting seeds, vegan seeds with them all the time. But it's like adopt, don't shop. You know, don't don't support breeders. Um, the other thing is that when animals um, who um, you know, wild animals that um, are bred, often that's for zoos. And obviously we're against zoos. So um, yeah, I mean, that, that needs to stop as well. It's like these animals, you know, wild animals are being bred and then it, it's causing 
these issues with the whole business of zoos. So. <laughs> Thank you for answering that question. Little, little challenging question there. And I uh, don't know, uh, Gwenna, did you want to add um, anything to that? Or They both kind of said it pretty perfectly the way I kind of would have, would have okay. articulated it. But yeah, I agree that, um, you know, I like how Amy used the term guardian because I always say, you know, animal companion or because so I, I live with the cat. <laughs> I live with her. And, you know, sometimes I feel a little bit of guilt because um, she's used to going outdoors and being wild and coming back when she feels like it, which, is, you know, which will be every night. And she has that wild side, but then she also knows how to cuddle and, you know, purr and all that. And because of, you know, coyotes in the neighborhood, I, she is now like locked indoors. I can't let her out. And I see her sadness. And, you know, it, it always makes me feel guilty because I'm like, she's not living her best cat life, you know, because of how we've just, you know, domesticated animals and, and treated them. But, you know, it, it's, it's tough, but yeah, that's just my two cents on that. <laughs> well, thank you for your two cents. A very important two cents, of course. So yeah, really, these are the questions that will be addressed in the in the book through people's stories and I, I think um, these are the questions that, that we we think about as animal activists mm -hmm. so I would just like to thank everyone for joining us and really thank the people who have tuned in and asked questions and also um, to Brittany and Amy and Quenna your contributors and I'm just so thrilled about your book and I'm really wish you the best and I look forward to reading this book. It'll be really, I think it's going to be a milestone book in the animal rights movement, really sharing all the different voices that are out there today. So thank you, thank you Lisa, um, for the opportunity to be featured on this webinar, um, the opportunity for, uh, you know, the being able to share about the book and having two of my contributors join me. So thanks for, for asking. Of course, yes, and we here at In Defense of Animals support you and your book and are just thrilled to be able to, to showcase this. And I also want to let people know that this month, uh, these activist author interviews are special features for this month, which is Activist Appreciation Month. And if you'd like to know about other programs that we're doing for the whole month of February, please check out the link, which is idausa.org forward slash activist month. We have another activist uh, author interview tomorrow, and then we've got all kinds of fun um, uh, vegan blogs by vegan therapists and lots of lots of interesting content there. So we hope that you check it out. I, I just mm -hmm. really quick, just before we sign off, um, somebody just commented to repeat the title of the book. Oh, yes, so, please. Um, do. Sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to slide that in there. Um, it's Voices for Animal Liberation, Inspirational Accounts by Animal Rights Activists, but it's known as Voices for Animal Liberation. Beautiful. Thank you for that very important question. That's the the um, really key <laughs> bit of oh. information we're going to need and in release, order to purchase it. Released on March 3rd. They're asking the release date again. Yeah. Yes. Release on March 3rd. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Wow. Well, we hope that everyone who's tuned in will purchase a copy and uh, share it with your friends and help to spread the word because this book is all about spreading the message of compassion for all beings. And, and for, for anyone who's in the Los Angeles area, there will be a book release party on March 7th uh, from 5 to 8 p.m. at Avo Cafe in Santa Monica. And um, the first part of the evening will be for people to order food and drinks. It's an all vegan restaurant. And the second part of the evening will be um, a reading where um, some contributors will be reading uh, part of their pieces. So uh, anyone in LA is welcome. It's a public event. I mean, anybody's welcome. <laughs> um, it's a public event, so. Great, well, that's wonderful. We get to come celebrate with you. 
So what, what we'll do is I'll um, share this information. Everyone who's joined us will be getting a replay link of this and any resources that either um, Brittany or Amy or Gwenna want to share. I know Gwenna probably has some great resources too with um, her, her work with uh, vegan outreach. So what we'll do is we'll share those resources with you when you get the replay and that you'll have a few more activist goodies to, to look forward to. So again, thanks to everyone for joining us. And thank you so much to, <laughs> to Brittany and Amy and Gwen. It's been such a pleasure having you on tonight. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Lisa. Lisa. You're thanks, so welcome. Brittany and Gwen and Lisa, thank you so much. Yay. Yes, thank you. And happy All Activist Appreciation Month. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. You too. You as well. Thanks. Good night. Good night.